Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, I'm Andy here at the Able Sydney booth. Uh, we're um, excited to have today another great panel. This is my last panel. I'm very excited about that of, of, of the show. We'll get to the end. Um, and today we're talking about aces, understanding aces. Um, so there we go. There we go. Um, so I have a great panel. Really, really excited to get the whole group together. Uh, and really, what we want to go over today is. is sort of. Oh, wait, how is our last guest? Get up here. And hey, here he is. There he is. There, oh, he's got a coffee in hand. Choke the mic, you get a lot of bass. All right, we're together. You hear that Thank cheer? You. That was for you. That was all for you. <laughs> so we just, we just jump right in. So yeah, it's okay. get comfortable. Hello, um, hello. Hello. So uh, today, talking about the evolution and the current state of ACES in the business overall, we're gonna, and how it applies to uh, both acquisition and, 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 and your experiences. So just going through the panel from left, from left to right, start with Bobby Rubato, colorist and DIT and all around uh, industry expert. There we go, some feedback, that's good. Thank you, Bobby, for coming. We got Andy Maltz, um, and I love another Andy, personally. He's managing, managing director of the Science and Technology Council for the Academy, so he's really uh, one of the, the big brains behind ACES, so thank you so much for coming, I really appreciate it. Mark Weingartner, ASC. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Well deserved. He's a VFX DP and an all around fantastic industry expert. Jim Wick, uh, colorist at uh, Olympusat and founder of the Colorist Society International, a great new group of colorists, of the well found. And then finally, and last but not least, Teo Van Dyssen at ASC uh, here as well to join us. And uh, I was wanting to get started off by. Um, and we got a good group, that's awesome. Um, it started off by talking about sort of the evolution that we've seen over the last years and since the launch of ACES 1.0 standard, uh, what we've seen uh, on the adoption of ACES as a standard. And uh, if, you know, this is uh, a standard well accepted by the industry now, but how, how did we get here? Uh, and uh, what was it looking like? What's the state of the of, of aces in the world? Andy, I want to start with you, being the uh, I want to put you on on, on point right now. Uh, all right, so it all started at a 50,000 watt radio station. Well, no, no. <laughs> it actually started uh, uh, at the academy uh, about 14 years ago. Uh, uh, one of our science Techno technology council members noticed that when you sent out a piece of film for scanning to three different facilities, you got three different digital images back at all. There were no standards, there were no digital interchange standards, and that's how we started the project. And also at the Academy, uh, long-term archiving of digitally created motion pictures is a big concern of us. We operate the country's fourth largest film archive, and we knew digital prints were coming. And the one part that we knew we could help with were file format standards, because that's one of the things you need to to have uh, digital movies last a really long time in an archive. And then as we got into the project, we discovered that, oh, color management, digital color management, that's really hard. That's, that's a big problem. So we went to work, and we spent uh, almost 10 years uh, figuring all of this stuff out and came to market, basically, in 2014 with ASUS 1.0. Yeah. And it wasn't just the academy that did the work. We were really the convener of uh, a couple of hundred of the industry's smartest color scientists, practitioners, engineers, filmmakers, you know, who, who knew how to use uh, the, the various bits and pieces out there. So we released a set of specifications. We uh, created something called the ACES logo program, which was a set of technical criteria for equipment manufacturers to build ACES into their equipment to, and turned it loose. So it's been about two years. Yeah. And so here we are with an ACES panel that uh, the Academy wasn't actually behind setting up. <laughs> so that's success? What does ACES stand for? That's a great question, Mark. So ACES stands for a good one. the Academy Color Encoding System. Everyone loves it. They love it. They're screaming for it. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's GoPro somewhere in the background. GoPro. <laughs> Not ACES. <laughs> so uh, here we are uh, two years later. And uh, ACES uh, has been the, uh, the, the basis for workflows on hundreds of motion pictures, small and large. Um, I can't mention the names of recently released uh, movies, but somebody else can because I work for the Academy. Uh, television shows, it's found its way into video game engines. Uh, it's been used in VR uh, uh, con experience development. Uh, we have 25 companies that are uh, ACES product partners. A number of companies actually have products that have achieved the logo. 
Uh, and uh, we're just getting ready to launch another round of extensions. We'll talk about that later. Other than that, yeah. So adoption is up, and I, I, I've noticed this uh, just from you know hearing uh, through the industry, hearing about it through the logo program, but also just in general. And, and one of the great things about this panel today, and that we're all excited about, is Bobby and and Teo actually just finished a, 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 a Disney feature, right? Um, where we actually had Aces both on set and through the post process. So. But can you guys talk about that and go back and forth here about your pro how, how um, the workflow impacted the on-set side, and then maybe we can back into the post side a little bit. But starting on set, I'd like to hear what this process was like and how it benefited you. So let me um, into, into, do an introduction. Um, Aces was uh, born in uh, 2014. I, um, I, I did Aces in uh, 2013. That was version 0 0.2. So you were in early. I was in early, and uh, I uh, yeah, I experienced it uh, as an uh, meet as an as a system that was on uh, steroids in the beginning. So it was like you touched one of the balls, and it was like wow, <laughs> <laughs> something was more than I expected coming from film. So for me, coming from film to digital, uh, that was that was a, a time of hybrid between the two. And and that was it was the wild west. Everybody had a solution, and 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 it were all bad solutions. Never got an an an, an um, a system where you could trust what you could trust and where you could uh, uh, work with. In fact, um, the the I was following because I was member of the AEC technical committee in, since 2004. I was following the development, and every time I had another feature, I would ask. Um, what about Aces? Because I know it was developing. I said, no, this, uh, 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 not there yet. Uh, so, okay. And then finally, uh, Photocam says, because I had Photocam asked already three times, and they said, yeah, maybe we can try. And they was the first one with the 0 0.2 and the, and the production, oh, sorry, their, their team behind it yeah. uh, started to work with it. Now, that was very interesting, I must say, because... Um, um, they, they did the best. The first two days were disaster. But I always knew that they could fall back on the uh, CDL. Uh, it was not there yet. It was mostly thanks to the DIT who was afraid of it. Because uh, <laughs> after two days, I, it fell in place. And that's some years ago. And I haven't had any problem yet. Wow. So for me, that's all I can say. Because I just say at the beginning of a production, I do aces. And then the producer will say, aces, what's that? <laughs> now it starts saying, oh, oh, you want to do Aces. And then I say, uh, the first time I, I said that, they said, oh, is that from the ASC? I said, no, no, that's your club. That's the academy who has Aces. So you should know about it. And, uh, and so I turned it, uh, I turned it around. I said, you should uh, inform yourself about that. It is very good. I said, okay, well, how much does it cost? Nothing. <laughs> okay, you can do Aces, no problem. <laughs> so, so how it works, yeah. don't ask me. I work with it, and it, is, it works. Well, I mean, so, yeah. so I, I too started in a, with Aces on version 0 0.2. Uh, I did a movie called After Earth, which was a very VFX-heavy film. And in that film, one of the things that we had to do was send out to 40 different VFX vendors our color pipeline. So we said, well, we're just going to send you a frame and you just run it through your pipeline and make sure that it comes out the same at the end. We found out who doesn't look at anything. Because we had a number of people send us back stuff and I was like, you didn't even look at it because it's obviously different. You don't need to measure it. Um, since then, you know, on that movie we did three different versions of Aces, thank you. Um, and that was a little bit of a nightmare, changing color science in the middle of the movie. But after that, I, I work a lot with Filmlight products and after that, I, I, you know, Filmlight incorporated it inside of their onset solutions, and I was the poster boy for going out and checking, you know, make, going out with prototypes, and I started using it right away. And there were many DPs that I worked with whom I never said anything about because they would say things like, "Oh, aces, I don't like the look of it." I didn't understand what they were saying. The look of it. There is no look of it. So there were many DPs that I worked with that I just never told what I was doing, and they would look at the picture and they'd go, oh yeah, that's great, that, that looks wonderful, that, that looks good. 
And that, Teo that was the first. Aces, then. That's aces, then. The good, the good looking stuff. I, I never <laughs> told them it was aces, and if I did, I would get in trouble. Teo was the first one who was like, I do aces. And I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> we had a great time on set because he's one of the few people who asks to look at the uncorrected signal and the aces signal, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's, I know I can grade that later. I know I can do this. Okay, let's go. So building on that, that acceptance and, and then the fact that you're just doing that and, and the fact that, you know, there's no look to it. Can you, I mean, Mark, maybe you can explain. I think, I think I'd like to use you because I know you're good at translating these ideas. There's, can you just maybe for the audience explain the, the lack of the look? Because <laughs> like, it's not right. about a look. It's not like there's Ace's it's, color. I mean, there's Ace's color space, of course, but. Uh, yeah, it, it's sort of funny. If, <clears throat> if we made a column of, of properties you know, what is aces is a really short list. What aces isn't is a really is a really long list. Um, and and <clears throat> by the way, just a, a quick note talking about what you were doing as far as sending things to multiple vid visual effects houses and and getting back different things. In 1999, that was my job on Mission Impossible 2, and so which was all film. And the problem was horrendous. So, so it's one of the things ACES is not, is ACES is not how to fix the problem of we are in a digital world now. That's, that's not part of this equation uh, in the sense that what ACES addresses solves problems that we have had f in various ways all over the place for, well, at least since 1999. Um, <laughs> So, so if you if you want to think about um, trying, I'm trying to think of a really a good analogy. Um, you know, people talk about color spaces all the time, and we're all used to looking at that the diagram, which is sort of you know that kind of shark finny thing, but not quite, but a little curvier than that. And what that is is a two dimensional representation of a three dimensional space within which you can find coordinates that describe unique specific colors. And that's a very, the, the totality of it is very big. And cameras, never, and film never reproduced that whole, vo that whole volume. There are no cameras that reproduce that whole volume. But think of it this way, you can write something on an index card and put it in an eight and a half by 11 manila folder, it'll fit. And, and part of what ACES does for us is <clears throat> the ACES has a color space, has a color volume, has a place we can work in that is big enough to encompass any of the different cameras we work with, any of the different displays that, that we work with, and any of the different cameras or displays that we're likely to work with in the future. Because since we're working for the human vision system, you know, we're probably not doing a lot of pho photography in ultraviolet or infrared, right? We're in the visible light world. And most of it is represented within that ACES color space. So you have this great big, you've got a great big volume within which all, all of the individual cameras and displays and um, look management, all the things you might want to do will all fit inside that great big, that great big envelope. Um, and so all you have to do in, 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 all you have to do, this is like the difference. Super easy, yeah. The difference between, this is the difference between simple and easy. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very simple principle. If you, if you take the images as you're photographing them, I'm not going to say as you capture them. Dog catchers capture. Those of us who are in the image business for narrative, we craft images. We don't capture them. We don't acquire them. We don't we, expose them. We don't expose them. <laughs> we craft them. We make images. Those, those images are made on individual cameras. Cameras have different characteristics. Um, what we can do is, we, if we know what the characteristics of those cameras are, we can take those images and adjust the code values when they come into our 
big ACES, big envelope, so that um, all of these different cameras, not all these cameras will look exactly alike, but so that everybody's playing within the same color space, everything is working within the same little world, and then we can do all of our color management, both technical and creative, in that world. We can archive that, that image in that world, within that great big space, which takes into account the fact that displays may change, projectors may change, and then after we've made our movie in that space, we have a way of taking those images and adjusting them as they go out for various archiving or display or projection. Um, they, they get adjusted in such a way that they will render as truly as possible on the in those various different outputs. So I, I don't know if that if that sounded simple, but it's you know it, it a bunch is. of different ways in a common space within all within which all things happen, and then a way of outputting that to wherever it has to go, so that so that the decisions that Teo made on set, of course with in consultation with the director and the production designer and all the other people that have an opinion, <laughs> you know, know so that those know. opinions that become the work that he's done, that that creative intent actually survives the torturous path through the pipeline and shows up on the screen. So, uh, if I may? Please. That it, is, it is easy. It's, you just yeah. do this. Another way, another way to think about it is with, in the good old days when we had film, the film system, you didn't have to think too hard about how to manipulate the film itself, all right? Kodak and Fujifilm and Agfa, they did all the color science and they built it into the film stocks. Cinematographers certainly had to understand those characteristics so they could craft their images using those film stocks, but they also didn't have to worry about the chemistry. So the film labs worried about the chemistry. They basically got the recipe from Kodak, and within certain tolerance ranges, the film labs would develop the film, and you'd pretty much get what you would expect, right? So when we moved away from film, and it was kind of insidious because we moved away sort of piece by piece, right? We sort of boiled uh, the, the frog, right? Yeah. You know about that one? You slowly boil a frog, and it won't jump out. But if you throw them in, they'll jump right out. What happened to our standards is we basically boiled the frog, <laughs> all right? Bit by bit, uh, we had digital intermediate come in, we had digital projection come in. In the early days, we had digital sound, then we had digital visual effects. And before you know it, we had these cameras that replaced, by and large, or in large part, film negative, right? We have no standards. So I did a little survey of the SIMTI, does everybody know about SIMTI, the side of motion, oh, right, the side of motion picture intelligence engineers? I looked at their standards database, and of the 800 some odd standards SIMTI published since its founding in 1916, about 600 of them are film based standards. Okay? There are about 60 some odd digital standards, and most of those are around digital projections, so DCPs. There are about 16, before we got started with ACES, about 16 digital production standards, and most of those standards are about 4K and 2K, just counting the number of pixels. Pixels, right, yeah, right? resolutions, right. So right. there are like five times as many uh, film standards as there are digital standards. Doesn't mean that digital is one-fifth as difficult as film. It just means we're really far behind on our standards. So yeah. we, ASIS is intended to be the replacement standardized image management infrastructure that allows cinematographers and colorists and DITs and visual effects artists to do their jobs and not worry about the lab work that they never had to worry about before. So would it be fair to say that it's, it's <clears throat> about consistency and, and, and flow through? So what you saw on set is what you get in post? Is it, or is it more about um, defining the workflow so that between post houses you have a similar result? I mean, what's is the goal beyond beyond being in the big space, right? Which I, I like that um, is the goal to have the results just be more consistent. Is that is that a fair? So enough? yes, consistent, predictable. There are parts of the image management chain that need that that 
can be nailed down that don't interfere with the creative process, okay? So what you see on set doesn't have to be the exact same thing that you see in DI because you may not have a digital projector in a dark room, but what you see, you have to be able to understand will be what it will be. Just like with when you shot with film, you didn't see the film negative, you knew what you were doing, and if the lab did its job right, you knew what you were going to get on the film print. So Asus brings that back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in fact uh, the consistency, one of the most important things. Uh, film um, had contrast, exposure, and color built in the negative. So right. if you want to change an exposure, then you have to do that with gels. You have to do it with overexposure, underexposure, with gels and with uh, camera, camera filters. And um, that is now, um, uh, th this digital went out of, out of whack, because um, somebody would say, uh, okay, uh, especially when a color corrector works from the raw uh, in, in the beginning, the negative, and then in the DI, they were completely intuitive. So, so they would change a contrast in the red layer in the highlights. So you don't know what it is. <laughs> you see that it's not good before you find what was wrong. Uh, it was it was uh, it was always damage control. Right, yeah. So the DI period was damage control, and part of that it was even you couldn't make the image that was possible in the DI because the the print, if it was a print, then it had to be even um, uh, corrected according to the print. So you couldn't do the correction that you were able to. So now we have this tremendous uh, uh, volume, this tremendous uh, space in. In, we can go berserk, we can use colors that in film were not even possible. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, the print was in fact your, your, your body, right. and that became your enemy because it was, went to the DI, the DI had much more possibilities. Right, yeah. And now, uh, when the no, no prints were made, now it was the wild west because <laughs> it went all over the place. Right, yeah. So to control that and to make a new a new uh, world where in which you can do whatever you want mm -hmm. and then create an image that you know if you have done that, that it goes forever, uh, forever, I don't say that forever, <laughs> because 16 bit is a lot, we think. Yeah. But maybe in three years, it's not that much anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the still photography is already in 48, you know, or in 16, 24. So, so it, it, is, it is a step. Right. So it is a part of what we what what we are now used to the change that is the only consistency that there is. Oh, very interesting. So, well, I guess I mean go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Actually, yeah, I, I, I just I wanted to add add one point, which is over the years in all different sorts of media, we've had different ways of create making uh, artistic color decisions you know, grading, grading whatever we're doing. But one of the things that working within the, the ACES framework uh, gives you is the ability to make those creative decisions without throwing away any data, without, with, so, so let's say you work on a project that has a future life and, you know, studios are very interested in the future life of things. Um, and it may be used in a new kind of display that that shows colors that that weren't possible, or has more dynamic range, or something. Um, part of part of the idea of using this as an archive format is to make sure that what you're saving has not only all of your decisions, but the the potential to to take it wherever you could have taken it. You're not you're not throwing out data, you're not constraining the final image based on the screen that's gonna be on tomorrow. Mm. So, question for Jim and for Bobby is because colorists. Um, do you find that it, this is enabling further the color workflow, or is it, is it giving you more, or is it just about, or is it really the same? Is it changing your workflow through the coloring process, or is it really just more of the big space in and out? The decisions are important well, here, as Mark said. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um, in my case, I wear two hats. In my in my case, I wear two hats. I, I work for a company in South Florida called Olympiasat. It's a, it's a vertical media company. So they own, operate, or manage over 50 OTT channels, uh, mainly uh, Spanish, but there's some English, there's some sports, and there's some religious. But it's a, 
it, it's, it's sent across the United States and it's sent down to South America. One of the channels, uh, the owner and founder of the company decided that he wanted to have a channel exclusively de devoted to restoring classic 35 millimeter Spanish language films. Wow. That's completely, completely different. So um, uh, I was hired about six years ago, a uh, senior colorist and manager of film restoration. And we built a pipeline uh, with, with a 2K scanner in Mexico City. <clears throat> the reason for that is that the films that, now again, the owner of the company, he purchased the scanner purchased with, with my input and the input of our creative services director. He, he, he purchased the uh, color grading suites, we built that, the restoration suites, so on and so forth. But then, he owned everything, he decided to purchase a film catalog. So we purchased 300 films. Classic motion pictures, 35, shot from 1939 through to the late 1980s. <clears throat> And I would love to say that these films were treasured beauties. Each and every one of them has a historical footprint in film history. Gorgeous films. But the way they were shot back then, and the way they were, they were well, the films that we received, the prints that we received, were terrible. We had films that were stored in garbage bags. <laughs> we had films that had been stored in foot lockers. I mean, the, the worst conditions. So when the films showed up, they weren't brittle. Um, they, they, they weren't damaged, but they were not in the best color space. The, the, the colors were faded. So what we did was we scanned everything and we sent the films up. The films could not physically leave Mexico. So the films came up on hard drives. We would ingest and then we would sit back. And here's where ACES comes in. I started, I started looking at ACES um, I've listened to, first of all, I feel honored to be sitting between two ASCs. My dad was a DP and a life member of the CSC, the Canadian Society of Cinematographers. So I have a great, great respect for cinematographers. Cinematographers may not have a great, great respect for colorists. We try, we try not to damage your films. No, no, but, but. But the thing is that I, I, I started looking at ACES at about 0 0.02, 0.2, what was that, the... A, that was about the right time to start but, looking but, at but it, yeah. But, 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 so by so, the way, yes, for everybody, so these, point, these are pre-release versions of, a, of right. ACES while we were working with the industry to figure it out. Right, right. We, we, Early version. Well, proxy ACES is actually part part of the system now for oh, or ACES oh, proxy yes, on on set. The, uh, no. So sort of ACES well, for guinea pigs. <laughs> well, the guinea pig in this case were these films. They were uh, clearly 60, 70 years old, and some of them had huge footprints in film history. So they deserve to be. Some people use the word restore. I use the word preserve. Yeah. Preserve. I want to preserve these films for future audiences, and that's where I started to look for ACES for help. Well. ACES at that stage couldn't help these films. No matter what we did to them, we weren't able to get the kind of response that we wanted to. But let me fast forward. Here we are at version one? Still uh, 1.0.3. Okay. At about version one, that's when things changed. Because I was able to, I was able to put them in the ACES color space using an ADX10 input IDT and going out to Rec 709 and oh my gosh these colors that were dead these colors that were we had a fighting chance now to bring these films back and it's because of ACES however ACES didn't work for all films now I also wear a second set of hats at Olympus Ad, and that is that when we when we do the film restoration, that's one part, but on the other part, I'm also doing, I've got three brand new features that were shot on red, and I've got commercials, and I've got promos that are coming in, so my team and I are busy. And we use ACES where we can, and where it fits, and where the DP comes in and says, that's the look I had intended. And what I tell my team is, we are co-authoring with the, with the DPs. The, this is the DP's image. This is the DP's vision. I don't want to get in, in front of it. 
But my job as a colorist is to help you bring that image back into where you want it to be. And if ACES can bring it there, and most often times it does, I'll use it. I'll use anything to so, get the image that you want. So Bobby, so same question. At the, really, in terms of your workflow, I mean, how does it, how, what's the impact? I mean, just in the, in the color decision. Yeah, in the, in, the, in the color world. Well, first of all, shout out to my fellow Canadian colorist, eh? <laughs> all right. Uh, I, when log films, you know, when, when, when log signals started being recorded onto digital media, we didn't have a standard for bringing it into linear. And so people would see these flat images, and then my job was to go in and twist this knob and twist that knob and make it look good. <laughs> and it felt kind of macho, because when, you know, with aces, once I do the transform, he walks in and goes, it looks pretty good. <laughs> and I haven't done anything yet. Because <laughs> you live that way. So it puts us <laughs> in a space where it's, it, you know, one of the things I like about, you know, where we've come to with aces is I don't have to mess with it that much. I mess with it to make the DP satisfied with the image that he wants. Yeah, and it, it, it makes my life a lot easier. Now, a little bit of forward thinking. Right. I've been working on HDR jobs. Yeah. in 4K and in 8K. And as soon as I sat down, I said, look, I have to work on a system that I'm familiar with that incorporates ACES and that has the 1,000 nit and the 4,000 nit transforms. Now, that for, for, for those of you unfamiliar with HDR, the nit value is the peak brightness level of the brightest thing inside of the signal. What we are used to is 120 nits with standard dynamic range television. With HDR, we've gone to a thousand nits. It's gotten, we've got a whole world of dynamic range to play with now. And I found, again, it was a lot easier to get started and get going using, you know, a, using ACES and realizing that there's a color space journey and I've gotten familiar enough to, to follow it. It, at the beginning, I think many colorists were a little bit reticent to use it because it kind of put it in a place where if the DP wanted to get demo love with it, he'd just say, you know, yeah, just leave it like that. But I also think that it gives DPs like Teo the opportunity to go in and really fine tune, and really fine tune what's on set. He would change color temperatures all the time. You know, it, 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 it was one of those things where it felt like we were making film again, and I was the lab. Let, let, me, let me jump in here for a moment because the other, the other hat that I wear, I wear many hats, but the other one, the main hat, is that I'm co-founder of Colorist Society International. Now until now, it's a year old as of this, the first day of NAB. So we have a year under and we have over 200 full members who are colorists uh, from Los Angeles, New York, London, and around the world. These are the best colorists. Uh, Eric Whip, who color graded uh, Mad Max Fury Road, Walt Pato, who did Independence Day 2. Um, Dale Grant, who did just about every Steven Spielberg film, including Saving Private Ryan, which, you know, back in the day of film and color timing. So we represent, we're, we're not a guild, we're not a, we're, we're not a union, we are a professional society representing professional colorists. And we have been asked, it, would it be okay to say? We, we've been asked by, by Andy <laughs> to provide feedback from colorists uh, as to how they, how they <coughs> like working with ACES. And it's comments like Bobby that will go into the document that we'll be submitting to, to Andy and, and to, to, to ACES. And this is the future of, of ACES, depends on feedback from the colorists, mm -hmm. depends on feedback from the DPs. This is going to be a, a collective that you were telling me earlier today. You know, the, the, the future of it looks very, very bright. Yeah, so along those lines, and, and just to clarify, you know, I, I just work for the Academy, and, <laughs> and uh, we've got a staff that works on, on ACES. We also have our volunteer structure, and which, which is the, the people from the industry that are involved in um, uh, 
building ACES, using ACES. Uh, the Academy provides some technical support and funding and, and documentation and that sort of thing. Uh, but we don't actually make movies. So we depend on <laughs> engagement with the industry for this thing to actually work. So we've set up a, uh, a forum, an online forum. It's called aceScentral.com. So it's aceScentral, no spaces, one word, dot com. It's all free, by the way. So you go there, you sign up for an account, and then you get the account, and you can look around, and you can post, and get into the conversation there. And that's our primary mechanism for getting feedback from the industry, because generally, we at the Academy only hear about things when there's a problem. Somebody calls and said, I can't make it work right. What's wrong with that thing? And, and you know, it may be an implementation thing. It may be there's insufficient documentation. And we don't hear all the good news all the time. Actually, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do the panel today was because I wanted to hear some good news because I knew you wouldn't be here if it wasn't good news. <laughs> so, so Ace Essential is the way to get there. And we also engage with the professional organizations, so Colorist Society, uh, the PGA, ASC, uh, Visual Effects Society, uh, and there's all the people that don't belong to any one of those groups, and that's part of what acescentral.com is for. So, just to, just to go to this website, by the way, it's a great forum. I've been there. It's really interesting. You can actually see a lot of content being produced this way. Just a shout out to it, because I, I, I recently discovered it myself. I mean, I knew, obviously, Ace has existed as a website, but I didn't know there was the forum there. You can see people posting content uh, produced this way. So, uh, But I wanted to throw back to the onset and to, the, to, to Taylor and Mark about um, a comment you made, Bobby, a, a while ago. Is it, do you find that it's, and, what you, and why you chose to use it, why you guys both choose to use it, was it for that freedom of, uh, is it for freedom uh, of being closer to the negative, being more, more, more like a... I, I, I'll, uh, I'll quote him. Rec 709 is a prison. <laughs> well, well, yeah, is it? <laughs> he said Rec 709 is a prison. <laughs> but, but, in Berlin, when you went there in the 60s, 70s, you go to Berlin and you think, I'm free. But in fact, you're in prison. <laughs> so in the prison, you can be very free. Think that you're free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Mateo, can you talk a little bit, about, if, if you don't mind, Andy, about uh, Deliverance Creek, about what your experience there? Yeah, that there? was my yeah, first. Please, uh, yeah. Yeah, first of all, I want to tell you that my father always said, no news is good news. Uh -huh. <laughs> so when I got the letter from him on the boarding school, and the letter is signed by my dad, I, I was sure this was bad news. <laughs> but so if I don't react, it's all good news. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so, what was the question again? Sorry. Oh, about uh, wh what you did with the limited amount of grading time that you had. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, uh, I'm not going to talk about the Levin's Creek. That was in 1913. That is like three centuries ago. I'm talking about yesterday. Okay. Yes. Yesterday, I finished a pilot that I shot um, three weeks ago uh, on ACES, uh, in ACES. And the person that I worked with, uh, Tiffany, my DIT in New York, um, had okay. not worked in ACES. Yeah. And in fact, called Bob and said, I don't and say, hey, what, what do I do? What, what do I do? <laughs> She's my what, little what do sister. I do with the results? She's my little um, sister. This is the number of Bobby. This is the number of Ram. This is the number of Ben in Canada. Ram was in Malaysia and Bobby was in LA. So these three numbers, call them and solve it. So uh, I know what to do, but I'm not, I want her to know more from different directions. So, so they educate my DIT. We finished in ACES. The first day was a little like, she was a little nervous about it, but then it fell completely in place. And from that moment on, um, cut to Monday, I came back from Beijing and I went straight into the color timing plant. And what I see is the, the timer that I work with is uh, the same timer who did uh, a lot of work with me. He sets up, he doesn't go back to, uh, to anything else than the ACES. So we start with ACES. And um, 12, years, 12 hours later, I was done with the pilot and happy with it. So, so, and I'm happy with it. And this is not a an, 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 an pilot that has just, uh, no, no, this is uh, primary blue, primary green, primary red, and all the colors that you can imagine. Very warm scenes, uh, and everything is in there because it work because of ACES. Because of ACES, I work much more with color. I use color as, uh, as an... Um, uh, as an, uh, an, a tool to create depth, and I can do that because it is it, it, it works in that in that uh, in that uh, space, and it shows me already when when Bobby has the image on the monitor and is calibrated. I see an image that I can work with that I 
that I like in film, when I had done my test, I uh, would know what it uh, was the next day, roughly. But now I see it really. And uh, because the, 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 the monitor is, uh, has the right uh, setting mm -hmm. and uh, what we put in has the right setting for the camera. So I get used to it and, and that gives me a, a complete freedom. And that has, uh, that has to do with the, the prison of 709. In Aces, yeah. I'm free. Well, he's all, <laughs> he, he also discovered a color that uh, uh, there was one time when we were shooting with theatrical lighting. Yes. And and I said, oh my goodness, I, I, I don't know why, but that, that color, and, and Teo goes, oh, I've run into this before. Aces doesn't reproduce that particular shade and, and it'll, it'll be okay. And I was like, okay, I trust, <laughs> trust. But man, you know, he, he understands Aces in a way that I think all DPs should really look at because it's it's like looking at the at the original negative. Yeah. yeah. Mark. So uh, uh, just a, a couple of things. Uh, one, I will say that I photographed a project, <clears throat> and uh, and we're using aces. And if we ever finish it, we'll finish it in aces. Um, taking a very different approach on our budget and our time and the speed we have to move. I had absolutely no way to look at a monitor and have uh, a sense of what it was going to be. So I spent my time much more the way I shoot film uh, instead of a spot meter, a scope, and all I need to know is where I am and having tested before, I know I'll be able to get to where I want to go. So it, it's not to say that if you're going to adopt an ACES compliant workflow, you have to monitor this way if you monitor, you have to understand. You have to understand and build your pipeline properly. But you can still shoot. Uh, you don't need to have a monitor on set and stare at it all the time in order to be an Aces compliant workflow. I, I just wanted. I've, there are a couple of things I've heard here that I think are worth thinking about to sum up. From my right, I understand that. Aces rejuvenates boiled frogs, so that's really cool. From my left, I understand that, that Aces makes old movies new again. So, you know, on this list of, of what, what Aces is and what Aces isn't, um, uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's, really an interesting, it's really an interesting collection of things. I'm a visual, I'm a visual effects guy. I mean, I, I, I started off in the live action world, but... I primarily work in the visual effects world. And one of the real challenges for us, you know, when I started, a big movie had, uh, well, Jurassic Park had 50 shots, five zero shots, in, in the entire movie that had computer graphic dinosaurs. Okay, that was, that was a big, a, a lot of visual effects shots, but, but not that 50, <laughs> okay? Um, I'd work on a show that would have 150 shots. That was a lot of visual effects. Okay, now a movie that has no visual effects in it at all has 50 shots between blemish adjustment, sky replacement, that billboard isn't period, um, you know, just little tweaks and, and things that now that we have the tools, we can do it. And a movie like The Avengers, the first Avengers movie had 2,100 visual effects shots. I don't know how many shots there were in the whole film, but 2,100 of those cuts were visual effect shots, okay? At that point, you're no longer going down, you're no longer going to ILM or Joe's Visual Effects Shack or wherever and saying, do my whole movie. You're now in a world where different pieces of the film are going to different post houses. Uh, that is to say, different visual effects houses. And in, and in some cases, you will have one visual effects house has created some computer graphic assets, whether it's characters or environment or something, or maybe just part of the look, and another visual effects house has to work with those. In the olden days, everything was secret sauce, everything was proprietary, and you couldn't do that. If you had three visual effects houses working on your movie, you'd give them sequence by sequence because they wouldn't share anything because it's all seriously mysterious and, and, and 
you know, there is an aspect of it. If you don't know exactly how you made that magic look, it's very hard to share it with someone else even if you wanted to. <laughs> so 2,100 shots, 2,200 shots. We're now in a world where that paradigm is not productive. That paradigm doesn't work. And there had, prior to ACES, there had been and there have been other people thinking about creating a consistent color framework so that if I take a file and I send it to three different houses where three different visual effects houses are working on the same sequence, when, they, when it opens up in the monitor, they should be looking at the same thing. And when they're done messing with it and adding creative things to it and send it back to me, I should see it looking the way they saw it so that we can have a dialogue about, no, that's too dark or that's too green. If, if the color management is not consistent across these different houses, across different platforms, across different pieces of equipment, because not everybody goes and, and buys the same Ronco color system and, uh, uh, on late night TV, and they, you know, there's, there's all different ways that people are getting there, but we all need to know we're looking at the same thing. And it's not as though that was absolutely impossible before, and now ACES makes it possible. But what is different is before, it was an awful lot of discussion about exactly how three different houses were going to open a file and make sure it was consistent. Yeah. And now we have a standard, literally a standard. It yeah. is that, you know, this is the recipe. Go buy your own flour, buy your own eggs. That's your job. But this is the recipe to, to cook the image to come out so it looks the same if you cook it and the same if you cook it. Now we have that, that standard makes a huge difference in the visual effects world. So, and, and, and that's a great analogy because I told you, because it's not one company working all the way through. And I think early on, Andy, we were talking about this, that one of the issues of adoption was that each post house felt they had, you know, a lot of their own secret sauce, right? They felt that they had, they had it kind of down. They didn't need that, right? But I think why it's such a great example, Mark, is that it's not all coming through one pipeline, right? You can't, you can't, it's not always coming through one house, right, to finish it. So I guess my question now to the group is, and, and Andy, please chime in. Um, how does this affect deliverables in the end? How is this affecting the way that the project gets sent out? And, and Bob, you mentioned how um, H HDR deliverables and all that. I mean, it's about consistency, and I think we all, I think we kind of got that. How does it affect the workflow at the other side when we're actually giving it out to the to the client? Well, uh, on a couple of shows, I, I as as a final colorist, I've had to make multiple deliverables for uh, theatrical. P3 for television, 709, and for web, for H.264. Yeah. Now, there's not a lot of standards for the web because we don't really calibrate our computer screens just yet. <laughs> but we will. <laughs> I found that it was a lot of... Is Josh Pines here? <laughs> you're you're safe. I'm safe? Okay. Okay. I've, I've made this statement before and I've gotten yelled at. Um, the trim pass is minimal. I didn't say it didn't exist, but it's minimal. And it makes it so that the, crea you know, the, the, the time you allocate for the creative is larger because there's no technical bug fixes at the end for, oh, we're doing the, we, we, we've done the P3 perfectly, but oh no, we have to go back and regrade part of the 709 because you know, we, yeah. these things always fit. You know, we didn't have too much of that. So, and, and this was on an animated film, on uh, uh, a film called The Prophet, where all of these things came out very consistently. Now, I, I, have, a, I, I have a further question about the future of ACES, so I'll save that, but. Yeah. Well, we're getting close to the end here, so. I mean, Andy, if you don't, just, if you don't, I, I don't know, I want to talk about the future of it, so maybe we should talk about that possible future ideas here. I mean, we only have a couple of minutes. How many, like, like two, three? Yeah, can can two, I make three. a prediction about ACES 2025 yeah, what is that? really quickly? What, yeah, okay, that so like? this morning I woke up and I asked somebody, what year is it? And they looked at me like I was from space and said 2017. I was like, okay, thank God. Um, <laughs> in 2025, at NAB 2025, we're going to be talking about volumetric capture cameras that allow you to take the surface normals of every pixel 
It's a volumetric capture. It's a voxel instead of a pixel. So in that particular case, I've got to have holographic displays. I've got to have, is it going out to holographic <laughs> display? Is it going out to a two-dimensional display? The other thing that is going to be incorporated is uh, shaders from the world of 3D are going to suddenly become our filters. And we're going to start incorporating those things. Huh. And, you know, we're, we're scratching, you know, they're technologists who are scratching the edge of the surface with that. But, man, as soon as you give these tools to filmmakers, they're going to run with them. So <laughs> what, I, what I really like about what I've seen with the ACES committee and what I've seen with all of the people using it is this is a community of people who are dedicated to keeping some sort of standardization as this whole thing explodes. You know, as the future comes, we've got, we've got people who are thinking about it. Yep. And who are Agreed. anticipating things. Agreed. 100%. So, next version of ACES, is there a next version? Do we need another version? Uh, so, yes, because the world continues to evolve. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, we always said when we released ACES 1.0 that there wasn't going to be a 2.0 unless 1.0 was sufficiently adopted. We wanted to make sure that we had the fundamentals of the system correct. Well, it's very safe to say now that there is sufficient adoption of ACES 1.0. All of the uh, uh, the companies, the manufacturers that had their misgivings, thought it was a threat to their business or didn't understand what it did, they've all gotten past that. They've, yeah. they've by and large figured out, oh, I can innovate on top of this new standardized infrastructure. That's ACES is an enabling technology for HDR. It's an enabling technology for uh, VR and AR experiences. So it's nothing to be scared of. So we are at this point now where there are a ton of ACES compatible or ACES supporting products, a bunch of movies and TVs, more than a bunch, lots of bunches. So there are some things in ACES that are a little hard to do uh, when we knew they were hard to do. But the pieces that are in place to make those things easier are now there, and that's the work that we're about to launch, which is making uh, the difficult things easier to do uh, do some enhancements to enable some other workflows that that were purposely left out of ACES so we could get to this this basic stage of adoption. And what we want to hear from the community is, well, what do you think? What else do you want? Because we all get to set the priority on this. And the only way you get to participate in setting the priorities is to use your voice. So go to acescentral.com. We have uh, very strong leadership in place. Uh, Andy Chang from Marvel Studios is our project chair. And uh, uh, Joachim Zell, or Jay-Z, you probably all know from Deluxe, he's one of our vice chairs. And Rod Bogart, a director of R&D technology for uh, HBO, production R&D for HBO. Who just, who just walked by, but I missed him. Okay, well, he's, he's going to keep on running since he heard me say his name. Uh, so we're in a really well positioned uh, with people that are up to their eyeballs in real live, high-end production work right now. Uh, we had a couple more SIMTI standards published around it, so those standards don't go away. So water's fine. Come on in. Let us know what you think. <laughs> All right. So I think we'll wrap it up. Any final remarks? Anyone? Uh, I have a, uh, one little remark. Is, um, I, have, I have a friend who is a, was a brilliant um, uh, commercial uh, director. Um, all this brilliant work was on um, negative, 35 millimeter negative, but finished on, uh, on one inch. No, not even one inch, just uh, three quarter inch. And uh, he, I know he's brilliant, but he cannot show it anymore. If he had had aces, it would have been no problem. So a lot has gone because of that. Well said. So I think we're going to open it to questions. Any questions in the audience before we wrap it out? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, what you talked about is mostly for high-end production. I work mostly for uh, TV, and uh, I would want to know if that applies to uh, uh, regular episodic uh, series, and also how concretely we can apply these uh, standards, and concretely how we work on the sets with that. No, sorry. Um, Mark and I worked on something that was absolutely micro budget. Mi micro budget. It, yeah. it was like it was like nano budget. It had no. It had negative budget. 
and the way I said that we could get through it was with aces. Uh, yeah, and 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 you know, part of the Teo's already has already sort of alluded to this, and as has Andy, uh, a lot of and, and and you know, all of us are kind of echoing the same thing. In a perfect world, you have all the time to make your project look the way you want it to look, but time is money. In the real world, the less money you have, the better you can take advantage of tools that get you close to start with. You, you're still doing something creative, but, but if you have tools that get you to a good starting point, because if you only have so much time, the more time, the less time you have to spend on getting to a good starting point, the more time you can spend on making things look the way you want. Uh, and so uh, low budget material delivering for Rec. 709 can benefit from an ACES compliant workflow if it helps you get from the set through post-production and, and get, your, get your color decisions made quickly because you're not starting from scratch every time you, you open a file. And, and, and I'll give you an example. In a commercial workflow, I had a DP who basically said, I don't have time to go to the DI. There is no DI in my opinion. We're finishing it right here, right now, today. And he literally baked in all of his color corrections into the image with secondaries and everything. And then he handed that to the post house and he said, you don't get the raw. This is all you get. Edit with this. This is my look. Mess with me. Yeah, he has long white hair. Um, Who's that? But, Hi, but Santa. not Santa Claus, bad Santa. Um, Three. <laughs> Tail, by Santa the too, way, shot the, Bad uh, Santa too. An Aces project, right? Aces. Yep. Hey, bad Santa too was Aces. That's right. So, but there's a lot of episodic TV that's being done with an Aces compliant workflow, where the DIT or the onset colorist. A lot of these shows don't have a DIT; they have a loader, and they have an onset colorist or a dailies colorist, and that dailies look is getting applied. And when they use Aces, the DP is not left out of the loop. Right. So Making it's, it's a set. really robust workflow for doing that kind of stuff. I have done only once uh, episodical. That was because uh, that was uh, uh, um, uh, piloted in, in Budapest and then in, it was placed in England, placed in England. And the, 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 episodic, the episodes were shot in England. And um, the, the director and the creative team, after three episodes, the, the British DP left. And they asked me, Theo, we, wanted, uh, we want our look back from the pilot. Can you come to London? I said, no, 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 I'm not old enough to do episodic TV. <laughs> so uh, and then they, start, they start asking me, no, no, you have to come to come to. OK, on this condition, it's going to be that camera. It, it's not going to be a lab. It's going to be Aces. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. And I knew that they were going to say no. They said yes. Now I was screwed because, <laughs> because I had to go to London and then one day had to change the camera, had to had to ask for aces, had to find a DIT, new aces, etc., etc. And we had no problem whatsoever. And he had the look of um, every episode. I could decide myself. I did not spend more than 12 hours per episode. What I like because the feature films. I never spent more than six hours color correcting because I would I would go and see an ep see the whole film. You couldn't stop it in one half hour. I would, would make notes. The timer would do the notes because film was not changeable. It was already baked in. So with a feature film, I was done in altogether six hours. The first DI was two and a half weeks, <laughs> and we didn't get paid for it. Yeah. So I, I, egocentric as I am, I said, no, no, that's not going to happen. I have to find a system where I don't have to spend so much time. And this was with the episodical TV, and cheap, cheap episodical TV. And it was, in fact, a uh, 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 revelation for me. Wow. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, go to acecentral.com, check that out, and th thanks. Uh, let's round of applause for the uh, the group here. Thank you.